Christ. For those of us who are here, uh, Acts chapter 25, open your Bible, if you would, please, to Acts chapter 25. The passage in front of us this morning allows us to tackle a very tough topic this morning. As you know, we take the Bible and study it the way that God wrote it, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, line by line, moving forward from start to finish, and we are quickly approaching the very end of this book. It's a fast-paced, fun look, uh, and we're really still kind of peeking towards the climax of the book, which we'll hit in chapter 28. Uh, The thing ends in chapter 28 at its highest point. But the issue in front of us today is one where the Scripture raises this this massive tension. It raises the tension that it also resolves. The issue in front of us is our rights, our rights. Um, We are a nation founded on rights. And uh, when you come to a passage like the one that's in front of us where the Apostle Paul actually grabs hold of his rights as a citizen of Rome to protect himself against the abuse and wickedness of those people who would otherwise damage, harm him, and stop his gospel preaching, we find ourselves at a very interesting point as well, because not only are we a nation of rights, we're at a time in our, our history where those rights are either slipping away or being attacked or being redefined in terms of what's wrong. It's possible to use your rights wrong, and it's possible to make rights for people to do wrong. And when you come to a passage like this this morning, you have both of these in play, and it becomes really practical for us because as we consider in an election year with several different ballots in front of us, um, things that really reflect uh, our commitment to what the Bible says God has put into His world that works, Um, We are committed as gospel people to push against darkness, but we also understand that lives aren't transformed by legislation, they're transformed by the gospel, and yet laws do restrain evil as God has put governments into this world uh, for that very purpose, and we want to see the world work the way that God made it work. And so we find ourselves sometimes in a very tricky situation uh, to know how and when do I use my rights um, and how do I fight for rights in such a way that I'm contending but not fighting, where I'm, I'm fighting for freedoms that don't open up other people's freedoms that enslave them to sin. There's lots of trickiness when it comes to us. Now, in our country, we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of We are told that that's an unalienable right endowed to us by our… So you've read that one. Okay. You've maybe read the right to free speech. You've read the right to assemble, the right to protest, uh, the right of the freedom of religion, the right to keep and bear arms, the right to own our own homes and use them for our own purposes, the uh, the right to have private property that's not subject to unlawful search and seizure. Uh, the rights to a just, fair, and speedy due process of law for accusations that might be made against us where we appear in court and on trial, which Paul is in the text in front of us. And we have the right to make laws with rights that are not accounted for when we come to believe and agree that those things should be our rights. So our rights is something that we are, are clear about, um, but right now contending for in our country. And with all our rights, we're quickly becoming a nation where our rights are making the way for so many wrongs. The definition of a right is somebody has access to whatever this privilege is because it's right to give it to them. That There is a certain freedom that people should enjoy, but there is this one difficult catch that the Bible adds to this that maybe isn't found so much in our Constitution or our founding documents. Now, just in case you're wondering, I'm the most patriotic person probably in the room. I was born on the 4th of July. That just adds one edge to that as well. So um, everything I'm saying here is part of a country that I absolutely love, but watch this. Depravity eventually catches up with democracy. When you give people freedom who are enslaved to sin, you've given them the freedom to sin. And and eventually, though well-intended and well-meaning as we might be, when we open the door to certain kinds of freedoms, we find that people will redefine what's right and develop rights for what's wrong. And that's the issue in front of us in the text here. Um, We're a nation that's battling for who has the right to come into our country. Uh, who has the right to marry whom? Uh, does, a, does a man have a right to change in a woman's locker room? 
Uh, Does a store owner have a right to protect himself in his store from looters? Uh, Does a woman have the right to kill the baby that's in her womb? These are things that you would think wouldn't be questions, but they are. And there, there is a deeper question underneath that that you're probably asking, who gets to decide what's right? Who makes the rights that we say are truly everyone is entitled to. Even the word right means that certain things are right or fair and that everybody should be given access without restraint or judgment. So, have you noticed, though, as a believer, how much harder it's getting to be a Christian in a country where our rights, which are supposedly given uh, on the basis of Christian principles, are being used to undermine the very nation and Christianity that it was supposedly founded upon? It's getting easier to get pulled into debates and dissensions and dialogue uh, with, with people um, that uh, fight about rights that don't lead to anything helpful or healthy. It's getting muddier to see which battles we should get involved with and which battles are not our battles, which hills we should die on. And here's a hard one. It's getting trickier to know who to partner with when it comes to those things. Because there's people who would not knowing that they have a Christian worldview, align with our own defense of certain rights that if we don't pursue, we'll be gone and gone forever, but we don't align with them in everything else except for that. And we find ourselves in alliances and partnerships that we never in the past might have been in, but because the greater cause is worth it, we allow. Now, some of that is because if your house is on fire, I don't care if you're a Buddhist, Universalist, Unitarian, Atheist, or, you know, a poached egg, grab a bucket of water and dump it on the fire, right? There's a cause of human flourishing that we all have something innate in us that God put there, Romans 2 says, that want us to see the world work the way that God made it. But when morality declines because corruption spreads in a country where depravity is caught up with democracy, you find us doing what we're doing in Acts chapter 25, talking about the two things you're never supposed to talk about, which are politics and religion. So let's have that talk, can we? Because it's the issue of Acts chapter 25. Uh, He takes us into something about how to be a faithful believer in a world that's increasingly hostile to the gospel without getting, listen, pulled into the traps that the enemy has laid for us. There are certain traps with our rights that we could fall into, and even though we're right, we are wrong. And aren't you glad that the Scripture uh, does this? Aren't you glad that, that in the normal flow of the exposition of God's Word, God for us raises the issues, and He speaks to those issues with clarity and gives us a way forward? And the question that Acts raises for us here in chapter 25 is, how do I stand for the right rights in the right way? Because Paul is going to invoke a right that he has that's been given to him by Rome to get out of a mess that he's in, where our hero, Paul, is faced with the very same kind of dilemma in our day uh, as was true in his day. He lived in a pagan culture where Rome was the superpower, and the guy who was over it all worshipped himself. He was corrupt, he was young, he was arrogant, his name is Nero, he was homosexual, he put Christians on fire at his garden parties after dipping them in tar and lighting them so his friends could see. He did unspeakable things, dressed up in animal skins, running around and attacking people. The guy was mashugana, if you want a word. And so here is the guy that Paul says... I want to invoke my rights to stand in front of him. See, in verse 11 of Acts chapter 25, this is really kind of the the main landing strip for us in the text. In Acts chapter 25, verse 11, Paul's being accused in the trial of century of something he hasn't done. He says in verse 11, if I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of me, which these men accuse, no one can hand me over them. I appeal to Caesar. Now, this is a fascinating moment uh, because the apostle Paul knew what his rights were, but he's been sitting on these rights for two years. There's a situation where he's been in that now the game has changed, and, and no longer is it an opportunity for him to advance the gospel in the place where he would preach to the people that he wants to see know Jesus. Now, the only thing that's true in this group with these people is they want Paul dead, and they will manipulate laws in order to kill him. 
There are certain laws that Rome had to protect Paul and actually gave Paul the freedom to do what he was doing. But those laws now were being increasingly stripped away by a group of people who were giving political expediency and concessions that compromised the law in order to kill this guy. And Paul said, you know what? Everything is laid in front of you. You've seen the evidence and facts. There are certain circumstances that Rome has allowed that if our case meets that standard, I can blow this popsicle stand and I can stand right in front of the emperor himself and I'm taking that right right now. So it's not just the equivalent of, oh no, you guys are going to hurt me, base. This is, I'm not going to be subject to the abuse of wickedness and die and have you thwart God's perfect plan to advance the gospel and even use me because you got some pet issue that now you're manipulating the circumstances to your advantage to abuse me. I am going to invoke now, because it's time, my rights and you're accountable to give me those rights. Now, what is he suffering as he takes a stand? Well, in verse 20, look at this, even the guy who is investigating the matters to see whether Paul is guilty says in verse 20, he says, I'm at a loss to how to investigate these matters. And so I was trying to figure out another way, maybe take him to Jerusalem and stand trial there. Uh, verse 25, I found, he says, that he committed nothing worthy of death. This guy is not guilty. So why is he on trial? Yeah, because of political pressure, because of the abuse of people that are standing there that want to stop the gospel, because of evil. And, and, and Felix who has been replaced now by Festus, couldn't figure out anything either, so he just kicked the can down the road for two years. But now that he's appealed to Caesar, look at verse 27, he's like, I'm going to send him to Caesar with nothing to say. It seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. Here's the trial of the century with no evidence and not even no evidence, no accusation. But I'm going to take you backwards, and we're going to go into the den of thieves who want to kill you, and we're going to let them do to you what earlier thieves did to Jesus and just take you out on the home turf. Paul says, no, this thing is a trap. This thing is a setup. I'm done. He pulls the eject lever, and he's out. This is a trap. And we talked last time, and and we needed to sit into it last time, by the way. We needed to kind of stop and linger. What do you do? Because Paul, who could have used his rights earlier, didn't. But when certain circumstances changed, he chose to invoke his rights and get out of that situation rather than remain in it, which he did. Paul was standing firm. He was holding fast. But now he's got a group of people that are both insidious and undermining. He's got a group of people that are vulgar and vicious. Uh, There's a spectrum that we identified last time, which is sometimes popular to describe those people in your life who are toxic. Now, what you got to be careful with as you do this is not just define anybody who ever does anything in your life that you don't like as toxic. And therefore, they are abusive, wicked people, and I should do everything in my power to get as far away from my can as anybody else who makes my life uncomfortable. That's not what this is. You understand that, right? This is a group of people who are eager to take advantage of the apostle Paul and kill him. And Paul is saying, wisdom says, I don't let myself fall into your hands. We identified them last time just by way of review and see if this doesn't stick. People who work as hard and as fast as they can to gain and keep the upper hand against you, who are always putting you under their thumb, that you're the one who's always wrong, you're the one who's always in trouble. And they go to work not only on you, but they go to work on the relationships of the people in your life that are around you so that they, who could make life easier for you, now make life harder for you in deference to that person. They pretend to be on your side. They pretend to be favorable to those people. They start dropping lies about you. They block any way forward that you have. And they damage all of your other relationships in life so that you can do nothing but face them. Those are the people that we flee. That's what Paul found here in this chapter. We also said that there's people in your life who will put a kind of pressure on you to get you to do what you normally wouldn't do and put pressure on other people to do to you what they normally wouldn't do either if they were thinking clearly or just rationally, to make decisions and take actions that you'd never come up with or never even consider on your own, but under their coercion to get you to bump the line of morality, to just make an exception just this one time 
No, those are the people that manipulate us relationally and we flee from them. And then there's those people who raise the intensity of intimidation. Uh, They feel the need to bring a level of threat where you feel the pressure to back down. You just give in. You either cave under the pressure or get out of their way, but they're going to go after certain results that they want to have, and you won't be able to stop them. You're outnumbered. You're outmatched. So you are distracted and paralyzed. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to respond. All you are is paralyzed under the intimidation. It's already a defeat because they're verbal and nonverbal. Their intimidation is a constant threat that you live, live under. These are people that we flee. We saw people that make a list of innumerable complaints about your, this is what was happening. To and so Paul's like, well, let's look at the facts. I've done none of these things And you yourselves have admitted you don't even have an accusation to bring. That that there's nothing that actually sticks. Uh, he, He says it again in verse 10. He says, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. Listen to the right that he's about to invoke. I've done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. And then he says, if I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to what? To die. If I did it, I'll own it. Now that's a point that's helpful for us to even stop and just put a little footnote here that says... um, if you are a Christian, you are someone who takes responsibility for your actions. Own it. If you did wrong, own it. Don't cover it up. Don't fake it. Don't lie. Don't try to get out of it. If you did it, own it. If you have to suffer a consequence for it, take it. Because above all people, we understand justice before God. We live before a just and holy God who saw everything. And if we did it, own it. That's why Peter says, and if you're taking notes, you could write the reference down, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, he says, it finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows if suffering unjustly. He said, but what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? Like if you did it and you got a consequence, you deserve it. So don't, don't be like, they're persecuting me when you're an idiot. Okay, that you do something that causes yourself to suffer, choose to sin, choose to suffer. That's on you. Don't put that on the Lord. Don't attach the Lord's name to that. But if when you do what is right, Peter says, and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So that's what God's looking for. So the right thing to do if we've done something wrong for which our enemies accuse us is just take personal responsibility and whatever we have coming to us. Turn yourself in, as it were. And I've had a few occasions in my ministry where someone came to me and said, I, I got to tell you something that now that I'm a Christian, that I did that I've never been caught, and that investigation's still open. What should I do? What's the answer? Turn yourself in. Uh, because why? Because God knows, God sees. Well, Jesus forgave me, so <laughs> I'm in hiding. If you're a believer, you make it right. We say, well, I, I did so many different things in, in my life before Christ. Well, remember Zacchaeus? When God saved him, he said, if I've defrauded anyone anything, I'll pay them back 400%. And I'm going to take all that I've swindled and gained, I'm going to give away at least half of it now. Like whatever I have to do to make it right is the evidence of a transformed heart. So if you've done something wrong, you've done something criminal, I'll see you after the service. Let's talk about it. You can make it right. Don't hide it. Don't dismiss it. Don't blame it. Don't minimize it. Don't rationalize it away. Take full responsibility. And isn't it true that the people in our lives who are looking at us, when they see us justifying something that they and we know is wrong, doesn't that hurt our witness? Doesn't that that devastate our attempt to do that? I got a rude awakening uh, in college on this. um, uh, I did damage to my gospel witness uh, by my hypocrisy um, because we know that unbelievers watch us like a hawk, but I was in college, I was working at a shoe store, and uh, the name of the shoe store was Foot Action, so it was like Foot Locker's rival, and, um, and I remember it was a slow night, and I was in competition with the assistant manager, the assistant manager, he works on commission, I work by the hour, so sales matter more to him than they matter to me, but I'm a competitive person, and so I'm like, oh, I'm going to so beat you, we're at the end of the week, we're neck and neck, and it's a slow night. 
And so uh, first person that walks in the door, it's a sweet mom carrying in her little toddler. And she's like, I need, she's looking at the, the sale rack where the shoes are super, super cheap. And I'm like, $2.99 will put me over the top. Like shoes were $2.99 back in that day. And, um, and I'm like, boom, I'm, I'm working the sale. And this lady's like, I don't know if this is right. I'm like, it's $2.99. Like, can we just give this to her? You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, well, well um, I'm, right before that, I had had a guy come in, and I knew him, he was a friend, and he just walks up and he picks up a pair of Air Jordans, and he hands it to me, he goes, I'll take these in size 12. I said, boom, awesome, let's go. And um, he says, oh, I gotta go run to the ATM and get my money out, uh, would you, uh, I'll just be right back. I'm like, okay, I'll, when you come back though, ask for me. Like, this is my sale. I'm going to close the sale. So I'm over here working with the toddler trying to find what pair of 299 or 399 shoes come in. So this guy walks in. He hands the Air Jordans to the assistant manager. goes, I need these in a size 12. I don't even need to try them on. And I'm like, wait, wait, bro, bro you were supposed to ask for me. And so, um, so he's in the back getting the thing. I'm like, hey, dude, you know, you really don't want the black ones. You want the white ones. Uh, the white ones here, I mean, this is like a new buck leather, and the air pockets go on the front and the side, and, and I'm explaining all the shoe product knowledge to this guy and trying to work him over. And so the assistant manager comes back, he's like, he goes like this, he goes, I said, this is my sale. And, and, and he starts walking towards the lady, and I'm like, and I got hurt too. Now, underneath that, um, this guy had just opened up to me, I think a bonehead this is, he had just opened up to me that night, it was a slow night, that his wife isn't his wife. His wife is his fiance. And his fiance, he took her from their home uh, when she was a runaway at 12. And um, they've been on the run from her parents. Uh, they've been hiding and they move from place to place to place to place when they kind of catch up. And, and I'm starting to share the Lord with this guy. And I'm talking about his need for Christ. But now comes the competition of who's going to get the sale. And so as he's watching this happen, I get the sale of the two ninety nine dollars toddler booties. I get the Air Jordans, the white ones. I walk into the back, I punch in my password, I hit submit, I point to the screen, and I'm like, boom. And you know what he did? He said, you know, you're just like everybody else. I started to believe that you might be different because I've been seeing your life and tonight I learned what the story is behind that. And now I realize you're just like all of them, a bunch of hypocrites. And I'm like, but it was that. No amount of explanation could have ever undone. And you know what happened that was next and that was worse? That night was over. We were at the end of the night. Word got to the parents that their daughter was in that area. They flew to somewhere else, only the Lord knows where, and it was gone and done. I had no credibility whatsoever in that moment. Why? Because of some stupid, I beat you, ha, ha, ha. There's, and that's a, that's a tragic example in my life, and it's maybe small compared to some of the other things that Paul might have faced in been accused of. But listen, our Savior is being judged by people who look at our lives to see if He's legit. And when they look at our lives who claim to be transformed and forgiven and free, and they see the same nonsense that they find in their own brokenness where they don't even claim to have a Savior, they'll take their brokenness without a Savior and all of His rules rather than Jesus. People are judging Jesus based on us. If I've committed anything worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. Uh, now, we're not going to show them perfection. What, what, should you, what, what should you do if you blow it? Own it. Own it. You want it to be such that if your enemies wanted to find an accusation, you could say, take your best shot. And they couldn't find anything. That if, and, and maybe we can say it this way before we move on to this next section. Whatever is known about your life, whatever is done in private, if it were made public, you would still have the credibility of the life-transforming power of Jesus to point to as the reason why they should trust Christ. Now, your opponents are going to take their best shot, and 
you realize that even if there's nothing to pin on you, they're not done. That leads to a second issue here, maybe a second page out of Paul's playbook. Would you help me out? No, here's number two. Know when to use your rights. So, so number one, you want to make sure that no accusations stick. But you also want to know when to use your rights. There's a time to use your rights, and you should know what they are. Now, Paul, Paul's going to model this through the section in the end of Acts. Um, many things, not the least of which is this. We have the right, listen, to insist on a fair and reasonable process, and when the moment comes, we should. When Paul appealed to Caesar, he pulled the ultimate trump card. I mean trump card in the traditional understanding of the trump card. I realize you have to qualify that now. But Paul didn't pull it prematurely. Paul pulled it at the right time. Not too soon, not too late. There were laws that protected him, and he used them, watch this, for a gospel advantage. He used them for a gospel advantage. And and there's a principle that I want us to linger on for just a moment because we live in a land of laws. We have a bill of rights. And even when you're arrested, you're under arrest, you have the right to remain silent. Whoever Miranda is, thank you. We have incredible rights and privileges. And I'll tell you this, if we don't contend for them, we'll lose them permanently. And, and, and let me just, let me sit on this for a minute with you, okay? Because when Paul says in verse 11, I appeal to Caesar, he was invoking a right that he had to advance the gospel, which he leveraged at the right moment. But we've been able in our country to leverage rights, have we not, for a long time. We have rights in our country that we can leverage with gospel influence, and we have for centuries. And, and there is a changing morality. There is a corrosion in our culture where those rights are being threatened, and it's not a surprise because depravity catches up with democracy. We understand that. But there is a new kind of trap that's laid in front of us when that happens that we also need to be aware of because those rights can give us an opportunity to stand or those rights could put in front of us a temptation to fall, and I want to talk about that. It's possible to use our rights wrong and actually work against our mission. Now, let me underline something I said earlier because I want to make sure that I'm not misunderstood here and that we understand this biblically. Laws are part of what keep a society from anarchy. Anarchy is there's no no laws. We see periods in Scripture where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. We are moving quickly towards that in our culture. Whatever the law is, it's, it's a pushover, right? The laws aren't enforced even though they're in effect. And what keeps a culture from anarchy, death, and ruin, just, just say to somebody, if you walk into this store, you can take all the iPhones that you want and no one will intervene. Just come into our country, illegal, we'll give you a phone and $1,000, and we'll take over a hotel and put you up. There's several things that happen in a culture that are designed to protect it from anarchy, to protect it from death, and to protect it from ruin. They're designed to enhance human flourishing. Now, somebody's going to say, well, laws and morality, um, you can't legislate morality. Baloney. Every law has a moral reason for it. The speed limit has a moral reason for it. What? Especially in school zone, what's the morality behind driving 15 or 10 miles an hour in a school zone? It's so that you don't, with your car, kill children. There's a moral reason for every law. Now, laws don't transform hearts, but they do restrain society from being as bad as it otherwise would. And those who are put, Romans 13, by God to punish evil according to that standard are God's ministers. So we understand and affirm that. We are all for that. Laws punish evildoers and they protect the innocent, as it were. And what Paul did, at least in this one right, he showed us that you have a right to appeal if the process is sketch. You have the right to get all the facts in the open. You have a right to call on the authorities to act lawfully. Knowing your rights is part of being a responsible citizen. And Paul, while he was a citizen of heaven, was also a citizen of Rome. 
And, and sometimes it feels like those two collide with one another. So the question is, how do you stand for Christ when Christ and laws collide? When Christ and those who enforce the laws collide? Well, even when it comes to holding corrupt leaders accountable to their own standards or the standards that they should be held accountable to, Paul's going to model this. Now, but can I also point you to something that Paul does here? But before we go further, we have to point out that Paul asserted his rights in a respectful way. His attitude, his demeanor, his focus, his language wasn't vulgar. It wasn't profanity. Uh, he wasn't thinking, if I get the chance, I'm going to push Nero down the stairs. There was something in Paul that understood the sovereignty of God even over wicked leaders, and he had a place to function in a righteous, respectful, and so long as it didn't contradict the Scripture, God's laws, in a submissive way. And yet, he says, I'm going to refuse to fall into your plans. He's not trash-talking. He's not insulting. He's not rude. He's not crass. He's not threatening. Just like Jesus, nothing. Nothing. What did it say about Jesus when he was reviled? He did not revile in return, but kept, nor did he utter any threats, but he kept entrusting him to him who, himself to him who judges righteously. But you want to know something else? And this is so fascinating. Timing. Timing. Paul invoked his rights at the end. We get to invoke our rights at the beginning. You say, why is that important? Follow this. There's something potentially dangerous, and there's something potentially wonderful with that. There is an opportunity to advance and flourish, and there's an opportunity to flounder and fall on your face. I want us to know, avoid it. So, so what could happen if you put your rights first? Now, this is, these are some traps I want to help us avoid, and I want to make some summary statements about how to think about our rights, okay? Think about what happens. When I'm going to start with my rights, I'm starting with the fight for freedom to preach the gospel without hindrance. Now, is that a good right? It's established in our Bill of Rights. Absolutely. Did Paul invoke that right? He did. He did. But what can happen if you do is you can make freedom primary and preaching the gospel secondary. Listen, if I've got the right to preach the gospel or not, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to preach the gospel. But it's possible then to spend our energy more on securing our freedoms and less on the gospel. And then we're known for fighting to protect freedom rather than living for the gospel. And do you see how that could get tricky? Because if you don't contend for your rights, those rights go away, never to return. And what happens? Society collapses. You're the salt of the earth, Jesus said, and you're the light of the world. What does salt do? It keeps things from corrupting as otherwise quickly as it might. What does light do? It pushes back darkness. So do you see how there is a fine line to walk and maybe a ditch potentially on either side of this thing? Now, we work hard in a country that allows us to establish earthly laws, and we see to it if our influence allows that those earthly laws match heavenly values. And then unbelievers who don't have that value system rebel. And we shouldn't be surprised, but it's to their own flourishing that we keep this corruption from advancing. But then unbelievers engage with us in open, open conflict about earthly laws, not about the gospel. You see what's happening? And then we strive to experience the comfort of a persecution-free lifestyle because what they're persecuting is us as we attempt to fight for those freedoms. And then we find that there's other people who say, no, I believe in your right to do that, so I stand with you in your right to do that, and so even though I'm not saved and don't believe the gospel, I want freedoms too. I don't share your values, but we're aligned. See how tricky that can get. Some of their life choices we can't support, but we end up partnering and yoking with people who want a freedom for themselves, so they'll argue for the freedom that we want, so they get the freedom that we don't want. And then, it's tempting to start making compromises for the sake of our rights, 
and we start fighting against each other if there's disagreement. And how many times have you seen a particular party get into a circular firing squad? Well, what happens if a house divided against itself falls? Darkness advances. And then, and this is where, if it wasn't obvious before, it would become obvious of where we landed. We stop caring so much that people are going to hell, and we care more about our access to our rights, that they not be infringed upon. Unbelievers reject a version of Christianity that's not Christianity, and we suffer persecution for our political views, not the gospel, and without realizing it, we've pushed the gospel all the way to the bottom. Paul knew when to use his rights, and he used them in the right way. You can use your rights wrong. And it's possible to be so focused on our rights that we elevate our rights to a higher place than the gospel. And does that mean that we don't use our rights? No, of course we do. Of course we do. We use them strategically. We use them without compromise. So just to reinforce for you what I want you to be sure and clear about, there are so many examples of believers in Scripture who held fast and did insist because even they were in a sphere of influence or in a political position on human flourishing and God's in heavenly value. Uh, Joseph, second command in Egypt continuing to hold the hand of an invisible God while he caused other people, even his enemies, to flourish. And while he knew that there were promises given to him and promises uh, given to Abraham, uh, there was a, a, a commitment that he had to hold fast and endure what he had to, to hold the line so the sake of the promises of God passing forward. He did that. Moses, he had to stand before a Pharaoh that didn't remember Joseph and point his finger at him and say, you let God's people go. And God's going to bring down consequences on, on you, sir, until you acknowledge that the most high God is your God. Job, surprising example. Read through the book of Job. You will find endless examples in what would be to our eyes a very primitive, undeveloped society of how many places and ways he was actively involved in things that are today called social work, advocating for the flourishing of people as a righteous and godly man. Nehemiah petitioned the king to release his nation so he could go home and rebuild it. And not only add to that, think of the prophets who all ministered not only during the reign of, but directly to kings. Uh, think of Elijah, uh, who prophesied during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. Think of Isaiah, who ministered during the years of Uzziah and the successive kings. Think about Jeremiah, who at the very end, before all the captivity started in the Old Testament, ministered during the days of Jehoiachin. And Daniel, who stood firm in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar and held him responsible and his son to God's authority. Esther, who could have done nothing but knew that she was raised up for such a time as this to lean in and to go forward and to do what was even not allowed and not lawful because it was right before God. And John the Baptist, who walked straight up to Herod and stuck his finger in that man's chest and says, you are under God's law, sir, and what you're doing is sin, got his head chopped off. See, those leaders raised up were faithful to stand, and they fought for rights, but if that right was taken away, you know what they did? They did it anyway. So there was a sense in which they held fast because it was right before God, and in certain situations where they had influence to uh, dictate what those ultimate rights would be to keep evil from spreading and flourishing, they did it. And they're a model for us, and we should. They pushed back darkness, even political darkness, and many of them lost their lives. Elijah, multiple assassination attempts, although the Lord took him to heaven. Isaiah, sawn in two. Jeremiah, thrown into a pit. Daniel, lion's den. Esther could have been decapitated. John the Baptist was decapitated. So you have people who, who live in the city of man on their way to the city of God with influence that helps, but it's an influence that doesn't just say we're going to help culture not send itself to hell. We, we're going to help whatever opportunity that affords us by causing people to flourish to make Christ known, to make God known, to make the one true and living God, the one that they worship. See, biblical Christianity has always existed and often collided with the rulers of the kingdom of earth. 
constant conflict. And there's a difference between fighting, and this is where we've got to be careful. Because remember what Jesus said? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be, do you know? John 18, 36, fighting. Jesus said, you'll know my disciples and the kingdom that they advance because they're not engaged in fighting. Now, we are contending. We are persuading. We are unmoved and stand firm. But if we're going to take a page from Paul's playbook, we could at least say this. If we can use our rights to preach the gospel, we should. If we can enjoy a season of peace without suffering needlessly, we should. If we can establish laws that keep evil from spreading in this world, let's do it. If we can be led by a leader in our country or state who is causing other people to flourish by doing what God says works in his world, then let's vote for them. Are we trusting in that to be the solution or the Savior? No. We're just being what Jesus said we are salt and light. You're the salt of the earth. If you lose your saltiness, it'll never come back. A light can't be hidden. So step up, lean in. But we have to avoid the baited trap that takes us off the gospel. See, we never want to use our rights at the expense of holiness. We never want to use our rights to establish freedoms that allow other people to do evil just because it gives us freedom to do good. We never want to get caught up in defending our rights with attitudes and actions that are threatening, insulting, or reviling. We never want to form alliances with people who might fight for our rights, but when we're forced to endorse their lifestyle, it's dishonoring to God. Don't have a relationship that compromises convictions. And we never want to be in a position where for the sake of political, political expedience, we just set the gospel to the side. Because you know what? It'll never come back. Rights are a wonderful blessing given to us by our Creator. And in a world without the restrictions, wickedness, and abuse of people, they will flourish. And Paul models how to push against that. But listen, we're gospel people. We believe in the preaching of the gospel, and we believe in gospel fruit. We believe that the only thing that can set people free and have a right relationship with the living God through faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection is the only hope for humanity. Amen? But we also understand that the fruit of the gospel means if I see someone lying in a pool of blood half dead on the side of the road, I don't ask them to fill out a doctrinal statement before I help them. That's an image bearer lying in a pool of blood. That's God's image in a pool of blood right there. So, so, What do I do, having been transformed by the gospel and knowing God, knowing what grieves his heart, knowing what he put into his world, the way that it works, how does he use me? Well, whatever sphere and platform I do, I take it, and then whatever opportunity that gives me to preach Christ, I do it. That's why we do that. If somebody else who doesn't know God wants to grab a bucket of water and dump it on the same fire, okay. But I'm not moving off what God has called me to do. So our rights should be used strategically and ultimately to advance the gospel, never as an end in themselves. I I don't want what I see coming. I, I, I look at the rights that we've lost, guys, and there's so many fences, literally even, that have fallen. And we are a culture that is overrun by evil. We are school systems that are overrun by evil. We are are houses of worship that are overrun by evil. There is evil in every place. We need faithful Christians. You know what's going to happen? Those Christians are going to be clearer and clearer as they stand up. And churches, you you know what my prayer for Desert Bible Church is? That they see such gospel fruit. Jesus said, that if you let your light shine before men, they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. My prayer for our church, you know what it is? Is that if it tried to close, the community would protest. They would say, you guys are making such a difference in the life of this community. You can't close. Now, we don't know what to do with your Jesus. So they, they want to kill us on the one hand, but they can't argue with the good we do on the other. And we want the good we do on the other to be such a testimony of the life-transforming power of the gospel that they listen to that message and not persecute it, but bow to it. What if there was a biblical church that had kingdom impact in the culture? 
What if there's clear Bible teaching that allowed people to understand exactly what God wants? And, and that voice was clear in the culture so that everybody, even if they didn't agree, weren't unsure what God says. What if there were a group of people who so lived out the transformation of that together where their lives were unimpeachable, where whatever you wanted to say about them, you would have to trump up something that was so grossly exaggerated that nobody would ever believe it, to just try to find something to stick to stop that message. But their lives were such a testimony, you saw the benefit and you derived that benefit. And what if those same people who saw us saw us stepping into those spheres of influence that God has given to us and bringing that message and that influence to bear? What would that be? Well, it's a church that Jesus said, I would build and the gates of hell will not what? Prevail against it. You know when Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 16? He took the disciples to the place in Israel where all the corruption and all the idolatry and all the sin and all the things I can't say that they were doing in a public worship service. Jesus said, do you see all of this? This is exactly where I'm planting my church. And so, while the issue is and always will be the gospel, we preach the gospel, we live the gospel, we live to see people transformed by the gospel, and we exhibit the fruit of the gospel. That really brings us now to our third and final thing this morning. When, when that's true, those things are true of us. We see Paul doing it. You can anticipate this. Always keep the gospel the issue. So make sure no accusations stick, right? Know when to use your rights. And number three, always keep the gospel the issue. Now look, Paul's invoked his rights, but he's going to continue forward with the gospel. The only issue is the gospel. But now Paul is there and he's in front of Festus, and Festus doesn't know what to do. He still has a problem. I have no idea what to send Paul to Rome for. He's, he's asked for political asylum. I've given it to him because that's his right to do it. I, I don't know what to say when he gets there. And then shows up in verse 13 a villain that will set us up for our study next week as we come to Paul's final sermon, final gospel proclamation, final defense in the book of Acts. Look at verse 13 of chapter 25. It says, after several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice, that's his sister, arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. Now, you know who this dude is? This is one wicked dude. This is the guy who had his dad beheaded James the Apostle. And he almost had Peter, apart from that jailbreak with the angel. This is the guy whose dad died when an angel struck him and maggots took over his body in Acts 12. His uncle killed John the Baptist. His great-grandfather, oh, and by the way, he tried Jesus in that moment where Jesus said nothing to him. His great-grandfather is the guy that killed all the male babies two years and under in Bethlehem at the news that the Savior had been born. This dude is a wicked dude who comes from a wicked line. So it's not like things got better when Paul invoked his rights, this guy shows up, but what Paul did with his rights sticked. So here is another wicked, abusive man with a mob of powerful men trying to hamstring the new governor to kill Paul. And then it says in verse 14, while they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king saying, there is a man who was left a prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it's not the custom of the Romans, we saw this last time, to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense. But then verse 18, when the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him such crimes I was not expecting. They simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion, about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. What's the one issue? The only issue that sticks, Jesus and the resurrection. You say he's dead, he's alive. He's at the right hand of the Father, he's coming again. Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and the resurrection. And what's fascinating here is Agrippa, Herod, he says, I would love, verse 22, to hear the man myself. Tomorrow I'll hear him. And on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium, accompanied by all the commanders and all the prominent men of the city, 
At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And here comes in chapter 26, verse 1, Paul's defense. Paul will now, one more time, when he opens his mouth, simply say one thing. God had a son, and he sent him into the world. He's the Lord of all. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He's seated at the right hand. He's coming again, and you must repent, or you will be judged by him. Paul's final defense, and that's how the book of Acts will effectively end. And that's where we'll finish next time. But, but before we pack up, can I just ask us to do a self-check on what we've said today? Um, Paul's about to lay out the most finessed gospel message yet. It's going to be so full and so thorough, and you, you want to be here for this because this is how it's done. But can I ask you in my own heart, I've been asking myself this week, are we dying on the right hills? That's number one. Are we dying on the right hills? Are we dying on a hill that's not the gospel? I'll die on this hill, but not about Jesus. If so, you might have been using your rights wrong. Can we be sure that the gospel is a more compelling cause for us than anything else? Can we check ourselves for that? Can we be sure that we're in the right battle, not the wrong battle? I don't want to fight the wrong battle in the wrong way. Do you? I don't want to fight the right battle in the wrong way. And I don't want to attack our witness by defending our right to defend our witness. You and I are going to get an opportunity in our country very soon, and this will be challenged again and again and again like never before, to walk the fine line between preaching and living the gospel. And we're going to have to make some hard choices that aren't popular with our culture. And there's certain rights once lost that will be lost forever, and that will be a dark day, an irreversible course that causes the collapse of our culture and civilization. And you know what? If that day comes, you and I are going to be found doing what? What we're doing right now. We don't need a political leader to give us the permission to obey God. We obey God rather than men. But let's not lose our commitment to do what's right, and let's not lose the gospel in our efforts to keep our rights. Let's use our rights for the advancement of the gospel, and let's do it in a way that's consistent with the gospel. Amen?